Hello everyone and welcome back to another instalment of the Work F1 show. We're about halfway through our sort of autumn break as we await for the next race in Austin. But as well as this, we are awaiting for the final driver that's going to make up our 2025 grid. We are waiting on the driver who is going to be pairing up with Nico Hülkenberg at Sauber. And so with that in mind, we thought that at the Work F1 show we would go through some of our favourite driver pairings over the turbo hybrid era and when i see, say we we are joined with two others today we are joined with our social sec pramica and also we are joined making his debut on the work f1 show we are joined by daniel thank you very much both for joining me today so essentially we've all compiled our top 10 lists of all of our driver pairings which we think have been great over the the period of 20, 2014 all the way to 2024 and yes we're just going to be discussing those for today so we shall start off Daniel if you wanted to go through your list first we'll run through from the 10th position to the first position and we shall see if we have any that clash which I'm speaking before I'm, I'm sure we do indeed so yes what is your 10th place starting okay so for 10th place we might start off controversial here. I've gone for Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon of Alpine from 2021. We, we're starting off very controversial. I know, I'm sorry. It's, sorry about that. It is spicy. It is certainly. So this was remind me. This was 2021 and 22. Yep. Correct? Am I saying? And what? So this is this is Racing Point, or is it Aston Martin by this point? I'm currently looking up. As I am speaking, so it was Aston Martin. Um, no, sorry, Vettel was Aston Martin. Alpine. It was Alpine. Alpine. It was sorry, Alpine. I have. <laughs> yeah. This is it was key Priestry PR disaster at Alpine. It was indeed. So they came tenth, eleventh. So I believe that is fifth in the constructors' championship. Yes, it is. So a strong driver pairing. Obviously, you've got two world championships between them. Obviously, both of them being Fernando Alonso, <laughs> and but yeah, certainly a strong driver lineup. I can't say I don't have this on my list at all. I did not think of this. Absolutely not. Ocon, I understand. Alonso, I absolutely understand. But in terms of driver pairing from their relationship, that wasn't one that particularly stood out to me, except for the the PR bumps that they both had, which were very entertaining. But apart from that. I don't think they um, necessarily brought out the best in each other. Okay, but I think it's great when they push each other, no? Correct. With pace, right? Correct. They were very equal throughout qualifying, I think, which is a, sh a sign that they're, um, they have very similar skill levels. I think it was probably surprising for people to see that Ocon was maybe as closely matched as Alonso, because exactly. as, as obviously Alonso has far more experience than him, and we, we know that he's obviously proven himself before in a range of different cars. But yes, I think certainly to certainly get those results, and they were certainly the sort of best of the rest, if you like, of those top four teams that we currently have at the moment and that were emerging, obviously being Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull and McLaren. And I think certainly that was back when Alpine were a lot more confident, had a lot more pace in the car and, and weren't as terrible as they are now. So I'm, I'm happy to go with that, certainly. Your ninth place position. OK. So for ninth, I've gone for Norris and Piastri of McLaren. Yeah, I think we all have this on our list, don't we? Um, significantly higher. <laughs> Norris and Piastri at third for me. Wow. So I'm at, I'm at fourth. Now, any prior listeners to the Warwick F1 show will know that I am a McLaren fan. So there may be a bit of bias here. But I think fourth position, certainly with the, the pace that they've shown. I've said, said specifically this season, even though... We've known that Norris has been able to deliver good performances throughout his entire career and Piastri, even from the moment his career in F1 started, which, again, as we we should emphasise, we keep emphasising on this podcast, was only last year, which is incredible with how inexperienced he is in F1. Where did you put yours on the list? Mine was third, but I think that my most controversial opinion, especially in modern F1, is that um, Piastri is, is able to win a world championship and I think he will do before Lando. So I'm betting on Max Verstappen winning the driver's championship you, this Wow, year. really? Yes. Okay, we haven't, wow. we haven't discussed this exactly. before. <laughs> However, constructors I think will go to McLaren if Sergio Perez continues to perform in the way that he does, which hasn't been incredible. However, I think it's Lando having to win every single 
race and um, winning every single race, winning every sprint, which then will allow him mathematically to win the championship, which because of Oscar Piastri, I don't think can be possible because he is as much of a threat, if not a little bit more on his day. I, I think I do definitely think that I would not be surprised if someone told me that Oscar Piastri was going to win a world championship one day. I think absolutely either maybe it would just be a little bit unlucky if it wasn't the case. He's a phenomenal driver and I can't see him dropping at any point before Lando Norris. That is the outrageous part, I think. But I don't know. I suppose Lando has obviously showed some signs of inexperience this season and shown that maybe he's a little bit unready for the challenge of actually a title challenge if that makes sense so yeah who knows i suppose only time will tell i'm surprised you put it this far down your list Agreed. but we don't actually know what are you a fan of any particular team because oh. if, if you're on work if you're on the work f1 show we need to know your bias <laughs> okay <laughs> because for catch and me it's obviously mclaren uh, for you it is mercedes slash hamilton mercedes slash hamilton of course and Okay, so most of all, I'm a fan of the sport, but I do have Macla oh, I do have so McLaren lovely. bias as well. Okay, fair enough. No, that's uh, <laughs> we need to get some other teams on this show. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's not good, but yes, but it's on your it's on your list. That's fair enough. I'm interested to see what you've got higher, judging that I'd say that's far further up for me. So we'll have to see. If you want to go for, can I just of close off on this Norris and Piastri? Of course, yes. I am hurting as a McLaren fan. That's why I've put them this far. It's it's not um. It's not a positive bias, maybe, because I am a fan of them, but they let me down. Uh, I think specifically Norris. I mean, he's he's won he's won three races, but um, they, he should have won a lot more. I think um, Piastri has been a bit of a revelation. I think, but when Norris has had his up days, Piastri has had his down days as well. Think about Zandvoort when Norris won by 22 seconds. Piastri wasn't even on the podium. Singapore, Norris dominated that one. Piastri wasn't that close at all, really. That was all due to, to qualifying. So they clearly had the dominant car, but they just couldn't put it together as a 1-2 performance like they could in Hungary, and even they messed that up, really. But that was the team. I know it's not really the drivers, but um, I've just been a bit underwhelmed. I mean, this will probably change next year. They might become the polished, finished article, and then we'll be screaming their praises and they'll be number one but I don't know no I, I think I completely agree and I, I don't want to go on it too much because I definitely make my, my opinions known on this podcast <laughs> but uh, it's sort of just my venting place <laughs> but I think certainly I get what you mean where they they don't seem to it's very rare that they get everything right you think of any dominant team that you have in history like well Mercedes for example uh, in their dominant period of the turbo hybrid era there were just so many races where they would everything would be perfect Hamilton get, would get first place Bottas would be on the podium the team strategy would be perfect and Hamilton and sorry for Miss, uh, McLaren it doesn't seem they have they've had too fewer races where not everything has been perfect either the team strategy has been off or for example in Monza where the team orders were maybe not fully disclosed or in Spain where Norris was maybe a bit over ambitious and therefore he dropped back as a result and I think maybe they might be for the constructors this season even though I do think they're going to win it it's more of a contribution of the fact that other teams have been off as well you think like Red Bull with Perez being off Ferrari maybe coming into it a little bit but also not being ready to properly challenge for the constructors and Mercedes also still working on their car so, but certainly with the drivers, I agree with you. I think they're not quite ready for that title challenge in Norris or Piastri. But then Piastri is obviously understandable because he's only in his second season of F1. Does that make sense? I actually think both of you are being very pessimistic for McLaren fans, which is so <laughs> ironic. Maybe maybe that's why, because we're McLaren fans, absolutely. we just expect more from, from our team. As that could Mercedes be a reason why. fan, trust me, the last two, three years have been absolute help. But looking at the progress of McLaren, especially from last year, and looking at the developments between Lando and Oscar in terms of um, consistency, in terms of race pace, it's all been very, very good. You guys are very much on the up. I can't believe you are so <laughs> down after the last five, six, seven years. But... Considering that the rules don't change as much next year, I think that McLaren will be the most dominant or are one of the favourites or my favourites to win next year as well. So Lando and Oscar have plenty of time to improve. Well, McLaren need to, need to take advantage of the time that they have 
on top yep. before obviously the 2026 regulation changes which might see now I don't know Aston Martin or Audi we've got so many teams that said oh we're going to be up there oh, in is. the top four we can't have six teams in the top four <laughs> and so we're going to have to see how that pans cool. out uh, your eighth place Daniel okay I have gone for Vettel and Leclerc 2019 to 2020 in Ferrari oh that's a, that's an interesting shout I'm going to have to just 2019 who said so they were Obviously, it's another year of Mercedes dominance, and I think you could say this for about a lot of Ferrari driver pairings where they have been, because I'm sure, spoiler alert, it's not really a spoiler, we will see some Mercedes pairings up of, up our list at some point later in the episode, but Ferrari's the next one you go to, and so I'd say certainly Leclerc and Vettel, I think that's a really strong driver pairing. You have, it was for a while, that dynamic at Ferrari where you have Leclerc as your prospect driver, the driver that you're working on to get you some world titles in the future. And it still is the case for that kind of at the moment. And then you have your experienced driver who has gone and been successful at other teams and he's bringing his experience and his wisdom to help bring the his current team up the grid, essentially. And so I, I, I would agree with 2019. Second place, uh, 200 points behind Mercedes, but we'll gloss over that. <laughs> but, but like I said, this was Mercedes dominance, so... Yeah, I think um, when you think you've got a four-time world champion there and Il Predestinato himself, you think maybe they should be higher up the list than eighth. But for me, uh, Leclerc, of course, was a revelation in 2019. He was the faster Ferrari driver. I don't really doubt that at all. Um, But Vettel, I think he kind of lost his mojo going into 2019, especially after 2018 when he put so much into that title challenge and it fell away in Germany. Uh, So I think... Uh, those two, they maybe weren't extracting the absolute maximum from the car. Leclerc, who's only in his second season, Vettel was falling away, as I said. So um, that's why they're relatively low on my top ten. No, I think I would agree with that, that even though maybe I suppose at the time we would never really expect them to challenge Mercedes, it was kind of obvious that they were going to be first place, but they maybe could have got more out of themselves with... And, and maybe if it was at some different time where Leclerc... I suppose Leclerc is still a little bit too inconsistent or more inconsistent than we would like. And then it was in that starting period where Vettel was starting to drop off before, obviously, you know, going to Aston Martin and pairing with Stroll. Nostalgia really colours my, um, my understanding of both of them because I absolutely adore Vettel and I absolutely adore Leclerc and I did expect so much of them. But to me, they will be one of the biggest what-ifs. What if the car was better? What yeah. if Mercedes wasn't as dominant? What if they both got to kind of live up to who we thought they would be? But, I, but I've got on my list a, certainly a, uh, a a couple of driver parents I can think of where even if they didn't actually get very far up the constructors, it is one of those what-if scenarios where it's just they could have done so well, but it's just the car wasn't there. And obviously we know watching F1 that that is a big part of the sport. You have to have a lot of elements come together if you're wanting to be world champions and one of those aspects is the car and the development and so that can often let driver parents like Leclerc and Vettel down a little bit. Your seventh place. Your oh seventh mine sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, for seventh I have gone for Hamilton and Bottas from Mercedes 2017 to yes, 2021. I, certainly I also yes so this is just going to be a, a obviously the whole period that the driver parent was there not a specific season. I have them but I have them second, so I had Norris and Piastri fourth, and I've had them second. Why? Maybe I don't know. Maybe we expected them to be a little bit higher up. Why? Why have you put them seventh compared to an over and under? Maybe some other driver pairings. I just think it's all about Bottas, really. Um, I was quite disappointed with his stint at Mercedes, if I'm honest, um, because if I look at everyone else above in my list, I don't see. A clear number one and number two to be honest but in Mercedes there was I know that's because they had a dominant car and they were both fighting for the championship so they had to install a first and second driver scenario but I also think it's because Bottas's race pace was nowhere near Hamilton's um, obviously he had his days he had his tracks where he was um, stellar like Russia comes to mind Bottas loved that track but I don't know I just 2018 specifically, Bottas had a really off year. I think he finished fifth in the driver's standings and Hamilton was first and it was 
a couple hundred points off, I think, so... Verstappen was also fourth with them that year, so... Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and that was in... I know it wasn't as dominant as 2020, say, for Mercedes, but I just think Bottas should have done better. That's completely fair. I have Hamilton and Bottas as well, but they're fifth to me. I think just the feat of what they have accomplished, 78 race wins, five um, World Driver Championships to Lewis, but also the Constructor Championships, it's not... It's not something that I thought I would see in this era. And with Bottas, I think credit where credit's due, I don't think he was ever as good as Lewis, but in terms of fulfilling his role as not just the second driver, but he did consistently finish second, which is not something that Sergio Perez has been able to do within the past couple of years. is the Red Bull as dominant as the Mercedes was back in the day? No. I don't think so, but... I actually, no, disagreed. 20, okay, 20, all right. Sorry, Fine. I just changed my mind. 2023, I, I mean, certainly compared to the competition, it's probably one of the most dominant cars we've ever seen, but then you could argue that that was only because the other teams went up to standard. Like we mentioned in the Mercedes era, you, you had cars like the Ferrari, where they, especially in 2018, they challenged for the title at one point, certainly in the first half of the season and, and other moments like that, whereas you didn't really have that in 2023. I don't know. I think it's just down to opinion, but I certainly... That's the reason why I certainly put Hamilton and Bottas second, because it was just the perfect well-oiled machine of just producing championships. You had both drivers who knew exactly what their roles were. And although, yes, it was a little bit more probably boring for us F1 fans, because we never get anything like a Hamilton and Rosberg 2016, where you had that title battle between the two drivers and the team, because each driver knows their specific role. But from a Mercedes point of view and from a team point of view, they had everything where they needed it to be. They had, obviously, Hamilton, who was going to be winning the races, and Bottas, who was going to be backing up somewhere on the podium. And we speak a lot about, as you mentioned, Pramica, Sergio Perez and the Red Bull pairing this season. This is exactly what's gone wrong, mainly in the first half of the season, but season because the Red Bull car isn't obviously up to standard at the moment. But certainly in the first half of the season, this is the problem that has been happening at Red Bull because... Even if Verstappen is up there and he's winning, or he's even just challenging for the win, Perez is not up there. He should be doing what Bottas did during that Mercedes dominant era, where he should be backing up Verstappen on the podium at every single race. And that's what was done perfectly by Mercedes for getting on for about four seasons, I'd say, which is an incredible amount of time to keep that period of dominance. And also, I think as well, even though Bottas is obviously nowhere near Hamilton, for 2019 and 2020, he did finish four, uh, sorry, second. So from that point of view, even if the car was more dominant than the other cars on the grid, he still finished above every other driver on the grid. So I think that's praiseworthy. Not only that, but the sportsmanship between the two, especially following 2016, I think should also be noteworthy. Bottas and Hamilton's relationship, from what we can tell and from the interviews that they've given, have have been very respectful and have been very sportsmanlike. And you can make the argument that maybe they wouldn't have been so civil if they were head-to-head -head a lot more, but I think following 2016, for the health and the longevity of Mercedes, a relationship like Bottas and Hamilton was needed. And without Valtteri, Mercedes wouldn't be as successful as they are. Yeah, certainly I think that that is one of the main credits. I mean, so you want about Bottas, whether you, you, you love him or hate him for his kind of obedience for the second driver role or his inability to get out of the second driver role but it is one of the main reasons why Mercedes were so dominant during that period of time. Daniel, your sixth place driver pairing. It is Sebastian Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen of Ferrari. Yes, no, I have this one down as well mm -hmm. and kind of similar for the same reasons that we saw. So mine's actually third for Vettel and Raikkonen. Mm -hmm. I mean, Second. just on paper, that lineup looks absolutely incredible um, with obviously five world championships between them going into that 2018 season and that period at the start of 2018 was probably the only real time that Mercedes were being challenged for their titles bar obviously 2021 so I, I think some credit should be given to that obviously it did drop off come the end of the season and I, I don't know how far I went backwards in that season but they somehow did um, I, it remains a mystery to me, top 10 mysteries that have not been answered in <laughs> F1, but it is still there. So, yeah, I, I certainly would agree with, with Vettel and, and Raikkonen. You said it was 
second on your list. It was second for me because of the what ifs. Again, Ferrari yes. and nostalgia. My God, does it get everyone? <laughs> Even as a Mercedes fan, um, I really would have liked to see them do better. The car wasn't where it's was supposed to be. Ferrari and their engine kind of um, so Ferrari and their sorry strategy problems have been a very consistent issue, and I'm glad that they're fixing that now. But my God, I wish Vettel and Raikkonen did so much better. Despite being Mercedes fan. Yes, certainly. It would have been it would have been nice to see if if they could keep that performance in the car and that gap in performance in the car to Mercedes in that 2018 season. Who knows? Maybe Vettel would be sat retired at the moment, a five-time world champion. Who who knows? But that is a whole other conversation for a whole other day. Uh, we're now into are we now into top the top half? Is this fifth now? It is. I've gone for Fernando Alonso and Kimi Raikkonen. You I'm like Ferrari. your Fernando Alonso shouts. Oh, you got a lot more Fernando Alonso. Uh, so, uh, no, no, no fair, fair enough. Again, same with Vettel and Raikkonen for me. It's you go into go into that seeing that on paper that could just deliver so much. And again, it's probably a case of what if. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. How come you've gone with that over Vettel and Raikkonen? Uh, so Alonso and Raikkonen was slightly earlier than Vettel and Raikkonen, only by a year or two. Um, I think Raikkonen did kind of... His pace kind of deteriorated. He did take, in that second stint with Ferrari that he had from 2014 to 2018, I think, it did take him a long time to get a win, which eventually came in the 2018 US Grand Prix, which is a great race. But I think uh, the fact that it took him quite a while to do it when um, he had Vettel on the other side of the garage who was putting up a, a title bid against Lewis Hamilton, I thought, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe Raikkonen could have been in that if he was, uh, I don't know, a bit more um, on the game with his pace maybe. But I think Fernando Alonso is just Fernando Alonso things, isn't it? It's just a peak driver. Everything about him uh, is um, optimal performance, to be honest. And we'll see him race for, what, 20, 30 more years? I think so, at least. least. (laughs) Certainly for, it's incredible how long he's been able to keep such a pace in the car. It is is brilliant, and it's, I I do certainly hope that we have Fernando Alonso in the car for another 10 years, even if that's probably his his body, surely at some point he's got to give it out. (laughs) We we can crowdfund him as a whole team. We we could do that, yeah. I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to. Warwick F1 show can start a GoFundMe page or something. I'm not sure it will pay anywhere near the amount of his wages at the moment, um, especially under... Under Lawrence Stroll, but uh, uh, we'll 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 see how that goes. Uh, with Newey coming in, also, not to not change the topic, but with Newey coming in, I actually do believe that there's more of a hope of a Fernando third title than ever. I think it's brought him back to life, you know. Exactly. Because before the announcement, uh, he was, Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence Stroll was catching I up to him a bit. You know? I did. Oh, no. And I think... La- uh, Lawrence Stroll, twenty-six. Who knows? Oh. Uh-oh. I... I, I don't know. I think, no, I don't think. We've had about five different teams that we've mentioned that we're like, oh, this, this team will be up there in 26. And I think, yes, Newey has come in. We did talk about this earlier on the podcast, but I don't think he's going to do enough, personally. I don't think one man is enough, realistically. It could get them into top three, like, kind of what they were approaching in, what was it, like 2022 or something, or the 23, where they had that really good start to the season. Fernando Alonso got that podium in 22, maybe. We'll, we'll, we we'll get so. back to you on that. But it's, start of 23. Start of 23, start of 23. Okay. yes, yeah. Um, but, but certainly, I think I think Adrian Newey could get them up to there. I think challenging for a title, I think that's a bit far, That being personally. said, they do have the resources they have all the reasons. Maybe. Maybe 26 is what we is what we need, because we are hopefully expecting a bit of a switch up. So, I think they're more likely than Audi, certainly. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, but that's probably that's probably a, an understatement, really. But, um, but, yeah, it's true. Yeah, certainly, I think, I think is, uh, uh, Alonso has still got all the ability needed to win a title I would go for. We're almost at your top three, Daniel. If you want to go for your fourth place now... Mm-hmm. What have you gone for? I've gone for the Red Bull 2014 lineup, which was Sebastian Vettel and Daniel Ricciardo. I don't think I've got that on my list, actually. I think that maybe Shame. just missed out. It is <laughs> Shame, Shame on you. It's, yeah. Ricardo won out, right? Yeah. Incredible. I, I mean, certainly back then, I think Vettel was the best driver in F1 by a country mile. And... 
Ricardo obviously coming up as a a prospect driver, and I think no one would forgive you, or sorry, people would forgive you for thinking that Ricardo maybe one time in the future he would, he might have won a world championship as well with how promising he was looking. So I I can definitely back that as a as a lineup. It's just a shame that Mercedes were kind of on the rise at that time, and that was the end of the Red Bull era of dominance. It's another lineup to fall victim to the dominant Mercedes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of... Yeah, there are so many. Obviously, we made, the choice, we made the choice to only go for 2014 to 2024 in choosing our driver lineup because I'm sure that no one listening to the podcast would appreciate me bringing up some lineup from the 1950s or something. But that does mean that we fall victim to the Mercedes era of dominance, which I assume we're getting to now. Um, with what is your third place, Daniel, on your list? So I have actually gone kind of left field. I've gone for George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. See, this is one of my honourable mentions. We will go through some honourable mentions, I think, uh, at some point in this episode. We, This is one of them for me. I think... Uh, I had two other Mercedes lineups. Not going to tell you guys which until I do mine. Uh, but yeah, that was the other one which I chose not to in the end. I don't know. I think on paper it's definitely a strong line. Obviously, Russell was a, a big up and coming driver. He had performed well in that race in Bahrain where he covered for Bottas, and so a lot of people I think saw that there were a lot of promise. We we probably all predicted that he was going to be at Mercedes at some point or at a top team by the very least, and. It was definitely a very strong lineup, I'd say. Maybe full and victor again, another what if, where it's if the Mercedes car was faster when Russell was there. He kind of got there a bit too late, to be honest. It's. I think that yeah, I think that Lewis still has the edge after Singapore because that last lap kind of blip summarizes the gap between um, George and Hamilton. Through keeping his concentration throughout the whole race, he was able to nab that third place. Um, and I think that, honestly, I think that Antonelli and Russell is a little bit more interesting of a pairing because Lewis, you know, going out and then Russell coming in, it kind of sets the balance in order. But now that, um, it makes it more predictable, I mean, but now that Antonelli is coming in and Russell, he's, you know, not that old. He hasn't been in Mercedes for that long. And although he has established himself, I don't think he's established himself enough where he is the first driver. So Antonelli could come in and kind yeah, of... Yeah, I think, I think it's, I remember when... Ricardo left Red Bull and Verstappen I think did definitely step step up and show a lot more maturity as much as much maturity as I suppose someone like Verstappen can show mm-hmm. but he sh- he showed a lot more maturity and I think we're going to have to be expect that or Russell Mercedes are definitely going to be expecting that from Russell where obviously the attention was maybe a little bit off him compared to his teammate in previous seasons but he's going to have to take that leadership role especially with such a young driver coming in which is probably, as we've mentioned, one of the biggest leaps ever, going from potentially a car challenging for race wins, uh, sorry, to a car challenging for race wins from an F2 seat, essentially. And it's going to be a big job for Russell next season. I think he's ready, though. I think I've seen maturity in George Russell, to be honest. I mean, some of his driving, sure. He what makes about mistakes, when he crashed he into, that. was it Bottas? I suppose that was when he was oh, Williams. Oh, come on, that was three <laughs> years yeah, ago. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose so, yeah. I suppose it, <laughs> that's just one moment that springs to mind, I suppose. No, but. yeah, for sure. That, that was out of order. But I think uh, just in some of the strategic decisions that he makes himself, he's got authority in the team. He's able to say what he wants. He knows what he wants, which is what you want from a team leader, right? You want a direction to head in. It's it's firm leadership. It's what Toto Wolff provides. George Russell has received the best tutoring possible from Lewis Hamilton and Toto Wolff on how to lead a championship winning team. So I think he's ready to lead Antonelli and Mercedes. No, I, I I certainly wouldn't uh, be surprised if if that was the case that he did step up and and show that sort of leadership role which maybe Hamilton had for him or say for example as we mentioned Verstappen with some other drivers or Vettel with Leclerc for example. But I think maybe it would depend on how good the Mercedes car is because if the Mercedes car isn't up to standard then there's a bit less attention on the drivers to perform but if Mercedes have done their jobs right and have provided a car that can challenge for race wins then all the attention is on the drivers to deliver and bring out the most of the performance in that car so I think that could also play a factor in it as well 
He's also extremely funny, and I think that's very underrated. So thank you, George, for carrying all the, all the media stuff. <laughs> that's true. I remember if anyone went to Silverstone this year, he did come and sit down with us to watch some uh, some England penalty shootouts against Switzerland. Both Mercedes driver did drivers did actually. So we should. So jealous. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should mention that. Um, so we're into your top three now. Go for it. What's your third place? Oh, so that was Just, my third place. Sorry, that was your third place. Yeah. Right, second place. Sorry. Into second. It's controversial again. I've gone for Verstappen and Ricardo at Red Bull. No, certainly. I think Verstappen is on mine. I think he's probably a bit lower down. I think, Verstappen yeah. I have, Ricardo is my fourth as well. Is your fourth? My fifth. So, yeah. Why so high up? Because... I think Red Bull, over the course of their partnership, had consistently the third fastest car, I'd say, right behind Mercedes and Ferrari yes. most of the time. So the fact that they were able to win, I think it was nine races over the course of their three-year partnership, I think is quite incredible, to be honest. I think when one of them wasn't uh, maybe extracting the full amount, the other one was, um, obviously... There were occasions when they were both extracting the maximum from the car and that ended in tears. Read. I know Baku's exactly what I know exactly what race you're <laughs> um, to right there. Drama. But uh yeah, I think both of them are well, I mean, was I repeat Ricardo. He was uh, a brilliant qualifier on his day in that Red Bull. Um and Verstappen for me, he was still developing at that time. He did make some rash decisions, of course. But his qualifying pace was electric. His race pace was arguably even better. And I think he is now all the better for the mistakes that he made in the years previous. Um, which I think um, makes them quite formidable in their days. With uh, Ricardo's entrance to Formula One as well and his um, victory over Vettel, the sink or swim mentality has really been... Um, embodied by both of them. So seeing them head-to-head -head and seeing them, the staff and kind of edge him out. I know that um, in terms of, um, like objectively, Ricardo did better in terms of qualifying and race, yeah, I think so. and race wins. Um, Verstappen kind of implementing himself as the no not the number one driver, but the prospective number one driver, yeah. you could really see and take fruition here. So I think he learned the most out of Ricardo mm. after absolutely kind of dominating Albon and Kvyat and everyone else. Yeah, certainly. And, and we also, as as you mentioned, we, sh we should, with them being the third fastest car on the grid, we should obviously mention that it was during the Mercedes dominance era. And if you can beat a Mercedes on your day, then, well, you're an absolute hero back then. So, But I think, for me, they're a little bit further down my list, only because of the reasons that you mentioned where sometimes they showed that little bit of immaturity, especially Verstappen, and that's why it could boil over sometimes, especially, as we mentioned, the prime example being Baku in 2018. And just compared to, for example, Hamilton and Bottas, where they always knew their place. I suppose that's always going to be the case when you have two very good drivers in a good car that could easily challenge and a, a very similar pace on a lot of tracks. That is going to happen. But I think that's the only reason they maybe fell a little bit short of my top three, to be honest. Fair enough, yeah. And we're, and we're on to your first place now, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Who is... I, I, I can expect this. <laughs> Who is your best driver pairing in the Turbo Hybrid era? The best driver pairing has to be Sergei Sorokin and Lance Stroll at Williams no. 2018. <laughs> Damn! Oh, Sorokin and Stroll, what a pairing. <laughs> Extracted the absolute maximum. Uh, no, it is okay, obviously... now tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it is obviously... Uh, Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, that's also my first place. That's <laughs> mine as well. Yeah, it's... Yeah, who else was it going to be? I think both... Two two top drivers in a top car. That's I think that's all you need to say for that. It's it's provided us with one of a great title battle as well back in 2016. And yeah, I, I think that's... Yeah, they were meticulous. They were brutal. And for me, sports is really about the athletes and the sports stories behind it. And knowing the history that they had as childhood friends then become teammates. Um, I think it was Crofty's commentary, they are everything but lovers, that really got me, because I was like, my <laughs> God. I mean, it is that intimate. They do care that much. And um, ultimately, they, they are as great as they are because of the sacrifices they've made, which includes this friendship. But again, through that pursuit, they both became world champions. And we really saw a world champion um, fight 
with both of them. Yeah, absolutely. I think they've both, they would agree that both of them have learned off of each other. It's definitely, I think, made that season and probably just lo losing narrowly to Rosberg in the end, Hamilton would have learned off of that. And obviously, as we know, he went on to win another, what, four world championships after that. Absolutely ridiculous. And Rosberg probably had to adapt a lot to having a challenger as good as Hamilton. So it's got everything I think you want in a driver pairing. And I realise I'm kind of contradicting myself a little bit here because it did obviously boil over at some points. But I, I don't know, I just felt like I had to put that first. Again, only a five point difference. Absolutely insane. I think they brought everything as a teammate partnership. They brought high sporting performance. They brought drama for if you enjoy the drama in Formula One. They brought the the romanticized childhood to childhood friends to enemies storyline. Um, so in terms of just um, for the sport, bringing in the viewers, obviously it was a dominant car, so maybe it got a, bit, a little bit boring after a while, but while it lasted those three years, um, I think they they did a great job um, of um, bringing the rivalry to life. And maybe I think in the years after Rosberg's retirement, I think Formula One kind of missed him a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So that is Daniel's top ten. Um, I don't know. What that was. <laughs> um, so Prime Market, if you go next, uh, obviously we know that you will have some drivers who. We've already or driver parents that we've already mentioned. So if we run through uh, just the ones that we have not mentioned that are purely on your list or on kind of mine and your list, if that makes sense. So if we go from your tenth place, mm -hmm. which I assume we haven't mentioned already. No. So this is Hulkenberg and signs at Renault. Oh, of course, oh. yeah. Completely, no, I... completely left field. When you think about so it. that was 2018, wasn't it? And they so they just I'm pretty sure they just beat. I think it was Haas. I'm I'm questioning that because I this is back when Haas actually were decent, but they just beat actually to be fair, they're not too bad now, but yes. Yeah, before before Rich Energy. Um but yes, yeah, so Renault is for, again, it's fourth place, it's best of the rest, and I think in that Renault car that is quite a feat in the banana car. So Hulkenberg has I think Hulkenberg has just been such a great driver for so many years now. I think he has to be included on someone's list. I I definitely know my my friend who watches F1. They would not allow me to walk out this room if if not one of us mentioned a pairing that's involving Hulkenberg and Science as well. He was was obviously very strong as he has been throughout many points in in his career. Absolutely. I think that they're very very underrated. That's why I really wanted to mention them. Yeah, they're tenth. Yeah, they are on Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton. But for the work that they put in, I really do think that they deserve the um, um, the recognition. Fourth place in the constructors behind Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull. Incredible. Unlikely pairing in my opinion, but they've never really had any major hiccups. So in terms of keeping it professional, whilst also keeping it competitive, they really worked well for a team um, that were in Renault's standing. Top of the midfield. Really, really solid. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Sorry, were you going to... Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, with regards to Carlos Sainz as well, I mean, we know Nico Hulkenberg's a fantastic qualifier and, and a great racer, but Carlos Sainz has been against some really tough teammates in his time. He's had, who has he had? Verstappen, Hulkenberg, Norris, Leclerc. Leclerc. Carlos Sainz has been very unlucky throughout his entire career, really. In, and in... Alex Albon. Yes, yeah. we, <laughs> his new challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's done great against them all. I mean, he's arguably the only one of Verstappen's teammate to properly swim when he's been faced against him. Um, true, Verstappen was in his formative years. But, uh, still I, Verstappen. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Verstappen it's, it's will still always Verstappen. be Verstappen for another 40 years. Yeah, yeah. I just think um, Sainz is uh, underrated, like you said. No, absolutely. Ninth place. This is also another left field. Ocon Perez. 2017 in the Force India. And I say this, and it might be a controversial, but they were also fourth place. As in, they really dragged that Force India into, you know, a respectable position. That, uh, yeah, so in, in fourth place for the 2017 constructors, they did manage to get, again, best of the rest, like we just mentioned for Renault. I didn't think of it. When I, I, when I thought of Ocon and Perez, because I did consider this at one point, I think I was thinking back to when I said that Ricardo and Verstappen, I put them down the order because it would sometimes boil over. And that's maybe why I didn't include it here, because I think Ocon and Perez were probably one of the most... It immature driver parents correct. that I've ever seen. Especially in the uh, Spa. Spa 
fall was quite yes, that was oh. ridiculous. That's that is the one moment that I we. Um, that's obviously what they showed. I remember they showed that in Drive to Survive, and I think that does just sum up their entire yeah. uh, history as a pair. That I would being say. said, two podium places, Paris and Baku, twenty seventeen, Ocon and Baku again in twenty eighteen. They weren't unsuccessful. And again, Fire versus Fire. Yes, they were immature, but again. I don't know how they made it work, but they did. And at the end of the day, it is about the points. It is about the constructors. Um, and they were ultimately successful for the tools that they were given. No, I, I suppose if, if we're given the same credit to Renault, which I think we definitely should, then, yeah, I can, I can go along with that. Um, eighth position. My eighth position is one that we've already talked about. Oh, one that we maybe not have talked about. The Staff and Paris? No, no, we haven't we talked haven't about, about the Staff and Paris. Is this in that twenty? Is so this is in twenty, what? One. Twenty one or twenty three? Okay, twenty one. I would say twenty twenty one, especially uh, being Sergio's f- uh, first year in Red Bull. Again, you're you're up against Max Verstappen, and I think that especially in uh, Abu Dhabi at the end, I think Checo did quite a lot to to help. Max, again, this is a very fragile, sensitive topic. You've, I was going to say, you have said the swear word of this podcast, which is Abu Dhabi 2021. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not an actual swear word, it's fine. Um, but no. It, <laughs> it has to be mentioned. Yeah, no, you're no, you're completely right. It was, and, and as well, we should mention that it is obviously a seat where many have fought, fell at the waistline before he came in. We, we're thinking of Gasly, Albon, and... Yeah, I, th- I think he did an incredible job in that first season and certainly cemented himself as uh, that second driver for Red Bull. Obviously got the win in Baku. You know, he loves Baku. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think he did a really good job. I can get behind that. But again, that, that take is because I think credit what credit's due. And again, objectively, they have won together quite a lot. Noted Max Verstappen has been carrying them, but especially in um, 2020. Two, had he not taken some wins off of Leclerc, I don't think Red Bull would have been hands as dominant. So again, credit with credit. Yeah, I, I think it's it's. I didn't put them on just because of that imbalance between Verstappen and Perez for that long, but I'm certainly happy to have it as a, as an honourable mention. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I'm not sure Perez was. Um... Bottas level. Well, I mean, Bottas didn't really do much in 21, did he? The second driver level that he was supposed to. I see. Is yeah, that yeah, what you mean? yeah. yeah. I, but I he see. didn't really need to be for 22 and 23 anyway. Yeah. Um, 21, he did his part and it worked out fine. But I just mean for the for the six uh, for the successive years, maybe he wasn't um, Bottas level. So that's why I haven't included him. But yeah, he's definitely an honourable mention for me. Yeah. Seventh place. Again, it might have been a kind of mid- uh, left field. We um, like left field on this podcast. <laughs> We're seeing left field a lot. I am seeing left field a lot. Um, Bottas and Massa, 2014. It's because I'm a really big, yes. big uh, Williams fan. And again, nostalgia really, really, really plagues me. But seeing as they um, came third in 2014, came third again in 2015, um, and Bottas just scoring a little bit more than Massa, I-, I love to see Williams being successful again. Again, this is during the time of not only um, Ferrari dominance, no, sorry, not only Red Bull dominance, but also Mercedes dominance. Yeah. Obviously, they wouldn't have, you know, they didn't have the pace or they didn't have the tools to be first. But I really like that driver pairing, and I also like the generations that they come from because I am also a very big uh, Felipe Massa fan. And Bottas, you know, wasn't as successful until about his stint in, like, this latter stint in Williams. So I really like. No, him. certainly, I I also have Massa and Bottas in seventh place for mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I said specifically 2015, but also definitely you could say 2014. In 2015, they did have four podiums between them, which, as we mentioned, in a period where it was sort of that transition, I suppose, between Red Bull and Mercedes dominance, I think that's certainly a tall order. And, yeah, we've got to have a Williams pairing. I should also mention as well, this is the only time I can really segue this, another honourable mention, because it is a Williams pairing, the only reason I did not include... I mentioned this to you beforehand... So the only reason I haven't included this in my top 10 is I feel like we need to wait a bit more time to show their consistency in their roles. And that, you can probably already guess it, it is Albon and Colapinto, which I did have as an honourable mention, which if they can continue as the rate that they are now, then that is such a strong lineup and a lineup where is dragging that car up the grid, I think, and really doing wonders for Williams. So, yeah, who knows? But certainly it has looked extremely promising as a pairing. Maybe that's just because we've been subject to Latifi and Sargent for the past few years, but I don't know. We'll see. 
what do you mean they're the best of the best? <laughs> <laughs> uh, apart from apart from their their driver pairings and possibly everyone else on the grid, but yes, apart from that, it's uh, <laughs> yeah certainly. Um, we're now on to sixth, correct? We're on to yes, sixth. Uh, Leclerc signs. Leclerc signs. Yes. Do I do I have that? Yes, I have Leclerc signs as well. Tenth. Leclerc signs. Uh, 2022 is really what did it for me. I think in the beginning of the season, obviously, it was um, Max and Charles that were um, challenging head-to-head -head a lot more. Um, but I think Sainz was still kind of um, pulling his weight. But now, during the last season and the last two seasons, Sainz has been doing... I think he scored higher than Leclerc in 2022. What, Leclerc? Uh, Sainz scored higher than Leclerc in 2022. No, Leclerc was actually second in the drivers' championship behind Verstappen, oh, I mean, and Sainz was down in fifth actually. Oh, but no, no, no. Um, but but yeah, still, still they kind of but yeah, still yeah. in the constructors they got second, yeah. which yeah. yeah is is pretty amazing I'd yeah. say. Um, and also his win in Silverstone I think is something I think about quite a lot. Uh, it might also be because it's the British Grand Prix and that's the one that I really oh absolutely yeah yeah I zoned into. But I think that um, Sainz did a really really good job. So certainly I think. Um, I think, logically speaking, we've both had either of those drivers in, in different driver pairings on this list. So if they're together, then it should be on there. I've gone for 10th only because, uh, I, I don't know, they just there wasn't too much, I think, results compared to the other ones that we've maybe listed, like the Mercedes combinations or the... Or the Red Bull combinations. And, and also they haven't achieved many things in the way of drivers championships obviously they've got a lot of wins co uh, combined between them but that's just maybe why they were on the list but they were just a little bit further down i think yeah for me it's the same except um they are probably if i hadn't if it was a top 11 i think they would be 11th on my list honorable mention yeah. yes yeah but absolutely. for some reason um whenever i think of signs and leclerc and ferrari i'm just cast back to um the first few races of 22 we had Leclerc, um, do you remember there were, there were all those memes about signs in love with gravel traps and things like that yes. in Australia oh, who found the gravel that, trap on the first that, lap? That solid month on social yeah, media, yeah. I love that. Imola took out Daniel Ricciardo at yeah. the first corner. I mean, Bahrain was great, second place, a Ferrari won too, that was, that was good times. But then the struggle started, so, um, but yeah, for the rest of the time he's, he's been great. Certainly. Fifth place, we're into your top, top five. My fifth place, um, Hamilton and Bottas. Again, we've talked about it yeah, again. We, in, indeed, yeah, we, we have talked about that. that I think that's going to be on, on everyone's list. Um, how come you did it a bit further down? Was that just because Bottas wasn't able to... Yeah, exactly. ...be he, up to standard with Hamilton? Exactly. And again, I've mentioned this many, many times before, but it is really about objective scores and credit to me. I think that Valtteri really deserves all the, the praise that he can get for the things that he has done, whereas Hamilton is not an easy um, target. And he never has been since his rookie season on Claren. Even he was giving grief to Alonso, so you know, and he was able to keep it professional. So I think that the, that Bottas and Hamilton relationship was extremely fruitful. And although it was a bit boring, even though I was a, you know, I am a Mercedes fan, um, they are extre they were extremely dominant and had like one of the best dominant periods of all time, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I, I really really enjoyed them. Not not exciting enough to be higher than fifth, but they yes. are very much the solid. No, no, I think I think we can get behind that. Uh, Fourth place, just narrowly missing out on the top three. Is Verstappen and Ricardo. Verstappen and Ricardo is another one that we have already mentioned. Again, very strong pairing that maybe got a bit too heated at times and maybe didn't collaborate as much. Third place. Third, I think all three of them are, are ones that we've already mentioned, but this really, is okay, order, we'll, yeah. go, we'll have a look at that. We'll yeah. go through them. But um, Verstappen and Ricardo also are very much diamonds in the rough to me at the time. Again, yes. very, very um, explosive, very. Full of potential, explosive, needed to be polished a little bit more. I think, you know, Verstappen kind of won out on that in that he became a, a multiple World Drivers' Champion. I mean, yeah, Verstappen's laughing at the moment, realistically, Absolutely. isn't he? <laughs> um, and Ricardo, as much as we love him. Uh, uh, yeah, as his former team gate, teammate gets fired, but uh, yes. I yeah, guess. that was a very, very interesting and a very um, entertaining time as well. Two very, very great drivers duking it out, making mistakes. Um, but again, learning from each other. Indeed. My number three now is uh, Norris and Piastri. Same thing. Controversial opinion again. Piastri. Yeah. Two, two very incredible and 
even though they are inexperienced, very mature drivers who are, have, as we've mentioned, done a really good job for McLaren so far this season, as, at least in terms of the constructors. Absolutely. I think that Piastri and Lando, I think uh, they both really push each other. There really is no being complacent, and even now, the idea of a number one and number two driver, it may be a little bit more fixed now, seeing as um, uh, Lando is obviously higher in the championship, but especially coming next season, I don't think that that guarantee is as insured. And I, you know, looking five years down the line, if they are still able to stay in McLaren together, they will be very, very strong, and I don't think that um, they could get weaker. As long as they maintain their professionalism and as long as they um, are willing to kind of adapt and change, I think they are very, very good for each other in terms of um, competition. Certainly. And we'll finish it off with the second base, because also we know <laughs> we know very much what your first base is. So who did you go for second? I went Vettel Raikkonen. Okay, fair enough, yeah. So, yeah, we've already we've already talked yeah. a lot about them for, for the, their reasons of mounting a very sizable challenge on Mercedes, at least for the first part of 2018. And yeah, five World Constructors tried titles between them. You can't really argue with that. Exactly that. I will move on to my uh, top 10 now. Admittedly, we have, the way we've done this, we have mentioned a lot of these. So I think I'll only go through the ones that I haven't mentioned. There are a few that we haven't mentioned already. Uh, so 10th was Sainz and Leclerc like was on Pramica's list. Uh, ninth, have we mentioned Verstappen and Sainz? No. Have, you, have we not? No. We've no. talked a lot about them individually and their individual driver pairings. Obviously, Sainz with Hulkenberg and Leclerc and Verstappen with, well, you could name so many, but Perez and uh, and Ricardo as well. Yeah, I went with them just because, I, I, I well, they, they were at the time obviously two prospect drivers who... A lot had a lot of potential and it was I think maybe even if it wasn't broadcast as it at the time it was very much a battle for who was going to get into that main Red Bull seat and who was going to challenge uh, for when the the drivers at Red Bull who were the drivers at Red Bull when when that was a thing back in 2015 Ricardo and Kvyat R- Ricardo and Kvyat so yeah so so certainly who was going to move up and take that that main Red Bull seat eventually and it did come out as Verstappen but I, th- I certainly think that both drivers had some incredible performances in what was a car that was nowhere near the front of the grid obviously with being Toro Rosso um, certainly next is ah next is interesting eighth place so I've gone with Alonso and Button from 2015 Ooh, wow, this is a very much what if because the 2015 McLaren car was absolutely dreadful oh, they finished they finished ninth <laughs> okay um but yeah it feels like it, it's on paper this is more of an on paper one where it's such a strong drug lineup obviously you've got three world championships between them and I think certainly if that pairing was introduced at another time when maybe a few years earlier when McLaren was more nearer the front they could certainly at least challenge for race wins and I think if if you if any top team like that if if like Ferrari or or Red Bull or McLaren had that current driver lineup then we would be saying surely these guys are going to win every race and yeah it's just unfortunate that that car was not there and and the second part of the jigsaw puzzle that you need for world titles what wasn't there at the time a fast car a fast car. <laughs> Proper engines. Reliability. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Was, uh, it Hon- was it Honda that they were using at the time? Yeah. McLaren oh, Honda. Man. Yeah. I can, you can see why they've... I can, I can, it's clear now why they've got rid of that part of their name uh, and from their car as well. It wasn't... The only team below was Marussia with zero points. <laughs> so they actually... They, yeah. They beat them, I suppose. But yeah, for a McLaren team... Compared to where they are now, especially, that's that's not good. And, and we know how bad the car must have been if they had drivers like that at the wheel. Seventh place, we've already mentioned Mas- Massa and Bottas. That was on Pramka's list as well. Um, so, I, yeah, I put them seventh. As I mentioned, multiple podiums came third to some uh, a, a very dom- in a season with a very dominant Mercedes car. That has to be credit worthy. Sixth place... <laughs> Sixth place hasn't been mentioned. This is slightly maybe just close to my heart is Carlando. <laughs> and you can you can you can see the the way I've written it as Carlando in my notes that this is maybe close to my heart. I think on the memes they have like ten world titles between them. But but I, I still think they were very promising. I mean we've both we've mentioned both of those drivers in other driver pairings and I think well this was what was it? It was twenty 
20, no, 2019, I believe it came in. Yeah. Was that correct? Mm -hmm. And I think they certainly did a good job of bringing McLaren to that next level. Obviously, we mentioned the two kind of polar opposites of McLaren on either side of it. We've had, obviously, Alonso and Button back in 2015 when the car was absolutely dreadful. And we've got it, obviously, now where the car is fully up to standard and is capable of winning races. But I think just important in a car's development is that middle period where it's that transition from the midfield to the front runners. And I think... Science and Norris were a big part of that. I think commercially also, they got a lot more sponsors involved. And as, as much as we love racing, there's also a whole other aspect of F1. Unfortunately, is the, it is yeah, an aspect, but yes, the absolutely. The sponsorship and the branding. But also, to me, that also means that these people believe in them. And it was Carlos Armando, Commando that made them believe in McLaren, which you know has paved the way for what they are now. So I completely agree that that middle development phase is something that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and commercially, they did very, very well. Yeah, and I think in that middle phase as well, you need two drivers who are working harmoniously, right? Yeah. I don't think Hamilton and Rosberg would have worked very well in a, in a midfield car. I mean, it wouldn't have been as intense, of course, because they weren't fighting for a championship. But if they were at each other's throats all the time, Perez, Ocon and Force India, then maybe, you know, the, the, the communication might have broken down. You hear that there's... Um, the sides of the garage side with their drivers and they don't talk to each other and it's a civil war going on in the teams which you can't really afford when you're a midfield team who wants to get back to fighting at the front right so i think um as well as well as being commercially viable their friendship and their ability to work well together uh, helped in other ways as well yeah certainly i think even though we we joke and we and we like their relationship as as a driver pair and, and as friends and that obviously makes for funny YouTube videos. But at the same time, that relationship is what you need for a midfield team because you need them to work together, again, as, as, as Daniel said, to, to fight for every single point that you can to get uh, a, a team like that further up the grid and ultimately to where they are now. Cough, cough, Gasly and Darkon. Yeah, <laughs> Ex <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. There, I'm sure there are plenty of other examples where that hasn't worked because of the relationship with the drivers, but I think that was a very wise decision, whoever put those two together at McLaren. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think then after that, we might have all mentioned these. Fifth was Verstappen and Ricardo, as we've mentioned, uh, as, as I said, lower down the list because of how he did it could get at some point. Uh, Norris and Piastri was fourth. I, th uh, I, think, I think that both of them have, have been very, very strong this season. Vettel and Reichram was my P3. And then I've had two Mercedes pairings at the top. Hamilton and Bottas being in P2 and a Hamilton and Rosberg obviously being in P1. So I think we've done quite extensive. Are there any other more honourable mentions that we haven't haven't mentioned as of yet? We've obviously had Albon and Colapinto, and there was another one which I can't remember. Some, no, we talked about the Stafford size. Some other one. Yeah. Yeah. You guys I, have heard it, wanna, it's fine. I do want to mention Albon and Verstappen, just so we can see the, the development of Albon. Like, he got absolutely crushed, my God. I think you could maybe say that for Gasly as well, yeah. I would argue, because it was, it obviously they had they didn't have a very good experience of being under the insurmountable pressure that Red Bull put on their two drivers, but I think it did help in their development, personally as drivers, and now that they are at teams lower down the grid and they have maybe a bit of pressure taken off of them, then they can benefit as a result. And that's why, well, I'd say Albon and Gasly are probably two of the strongest drivers that we've had on the grid for the last couple of years now. So I, I also think that there are evidence that the Red Bull system doesn't always work. It's great that they, they have their Max Verstappens, which, I mean, he's objectively done so much better, but Alex Albon has been leading Williams for a number of years. And I think he, he will do so. And he's a very uh, reliable driver that just needed time. I was going to say it took Red Bull quite a few years and a few tries to realise that not every driver is Max Verstappen, mm -hmm. right? They can't all be thrown in the deep end and, and, and thrive like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, arguably there were times where he didn't thrive, but most of the time he did, right? But um, yeah, there are a few drivers who need a bit more of a gentle introduction and I think they learned that. So they put more experience in the seat with Perez and I think that worked out. Uh, I also think it's funny that Verstappen is threatening to retire like every two to three races now. <laughs> you wanted a Verstappen, you got yeah, a Verstappen. Yeah, well, he's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just to keep the people people like Catch who just look at Twitter rumours on their toes of just like, oh, he's going to be going to Audi or something, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, that is that is very interesting. But certainly, yes, I think definitely some honourable mentions of drivers that have... Not benefit from the benefits from the Red Bull the Red Bull seat when they were there, but certainly in the future. 
But yeah, we've certainly done a very good job there of reviewing our best driver pairings from the turbo hybrid era uh, we hope that maybe some of yours listening along were a bit similar or different we don't know i think we've covered some of the main ones but we shall be posting many more special episodes to get you through this autumn break that we have before austin we have already released an ideal calendar where catch and i say what races we would keep on an f1 calendar or we would ditch if we were for some reason put in charge of the entire f1 business and of course we will have a preview for austin when that race eventually comes around in just over two weeks time but until then thank you very much daniel and pravica for listening i've been your host Khan hodge and until next time goodbye